Welcome to the Cross Border Interview Podcast, a podcast about getting out from behind the keyboard and just talking. Each week, we invite a guest or two to sit down and talk about their life and their work. I'm Christopher Brown, your host, and this is the Cross Border Interview Podcast featuring Deputy Mayor Angela Duncan. Today's guest is the Deputy Mayor for the Village of Alberta Beach. Uh, Deputy Mayor Angela Duncan is with us today. Thank you so much for being here, Angela. Greatly appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Chris. Um, Angela, my very first question to every politician I ever interview, whether it be municipal, federal, or provincial, is where did your duty to serve come from? My duty to serve? Um, Well, I didn't... I never really saw myself running for council, so I can't say that I have some innate duty to serve, but I have always worked in roles where I help other people. So I guess I have a natural inclination towards helping others. I have a huge sense of social responsibility. Um, I've always had a need to reach out and make life better. So uh, it's not surprising that I found my way into politics but my duty to serve definitely comes from a desire to help improve my community and make it the best place it can possibly be for my family and my children and my fellow community members. Uh, Before we start talking about the village and your community, um, were your parents political? Because you say you you have all this uh, uh, desire to give back, but were your parents that way as well? Did you get enshrined with that as a young uh, girl growing up? Or was this something that came to you later in life? My parents are not inherently political. No, (laughs) Uh, not in any way. My mother uh, actively avoids politics at every possible corner. And, and I was raised by a single mom, so uh, um, raised on a single family income. So I think my duty to help others and my, my sense of social responsibility comes from struggling growing up. Now, one of the things that I've, I try to do, I, I don't come in with questions. I literally just have one sheet of paper with just a few <laughs> notes on it because I, I want it to be a, a conversation between two people. One of the things I tried to find was uh, your first election. Was it in 2017 when you were first elected to the village council? No, I first ran in 2013 and I was elected in 2013. 2013. So take me through that process. So why in 2013 did you decide to run? Because that's that, that gets to the understanding of why municipal leaders do what they do, right? Was there an issue that the village was facing or was it something that you said, okay, this is lacking in the council that I need to address and I want to bring it forward? Well, in, so it, it kind of started a few years before the municipal election. There had been a by-election in the village, and that had kind of brought to my attention municipal politics. I hadn't really thought of it before then. Um, so from there, I started to kind of throw it around, joking with my husband, wouldn't it be funny if I ran for council? Ha ha. Uh, but then in, I believe it was August or September before the 2013 elections, there was some really disgruntled people in the community and they were very upset about some stuff that was going on. So they ran a series of town hall type of events at the local community hall. And that piqued my interest. So I went and in in all fairness, those events were exceptionally one-sided. There was no no counselors present. There was no municipal staff present. And, and, you know, they, they seemed very pitchfork esque. But uh, they, they brought to light some, some very real issues that were happening in the community that I think a lot of people didn't know. So uh, from there, I started to look into it a bit more and, and find out how truthful some of the stuff was. And it, and it turns out that there were some real sustainability issues in the community, not to the point of being unviable, but just general direction. So uh, I firmly believe that if a person's going to complain about something, that they have an obligation to do something about it. So Amen to I, that. <laughs> I didn't I didn't like the direction and I thought, you know what, I can do this and I think I can do better. So I decided to run and I was successful. I came in second in the election. Of course, we elect five people 
um, instead of just once, you get to vote for five people. And, and I did very well in the election. So, so just to clarify that, uh, so the village is at a at large election. It's not at a ward election, say like uh, Calgary, Red Deer or at Edmonton. It's at a at large. So every resident has the uh, has five votes for five councillors. It's not if you live on a certain street, you have to only vote for this set of uh, people, right? That is correct. And we also run on a Reeve system. So we elect a mayor from amongst ourselves. Okay. So, okay. Um, so let's talk about that election. Um, as someone who, as you've said, didn't really have that much political background, um, you sort of got into it because you went to a few public hearings. Was that election an interesting experience for yourself? Because now you're putting yourself out there. You're putting yourself out there publicly. You're putting out yourself out there to uh, get people to vote for you. How was that experience for yourself? You know, the election itself, it, it was different. Um, I've always been comfortable public speaking and, and getting out there and, and, and talking to people. I've held leadership roles in my workplace since I was 19. So um, that aspect of it wasn't very difficult. For me, the hardest part of the election is the door knocking, um, <laughs> which kind of sounds counterintuitive. I really, I enjoy getting out and talking to people but the idea of knocking on people's doors is a little bit intimidating. Um, the election itself went off really well, though. It wasn't hugely controversial, but we did see a, a significant changeover in council. The, uh, the, the thought of going into a ballot box and voting for yourself, seeing your, your name on that ballot, I've talked to numerous uh, candidates, uh, politicians. They say that is a surreal experience to see your name on the ballot because you know, hypothetically, if you vote for yourself, you're going to get at least one vote. You're putting your trust <laughs> into other people to vote for you. So for you, seeing your name on that ballot for the first time, what was that experience like? Surreal is actually a really good way to describe it. Um, you, you know you're doing it. And it's, it's funny, when I was telling my kids that I was doing this uh, interview, they said, well, mom, you don't vote for yourself, do you? You can't do that. That's not right. I'm like, well, of course it is. I think I'm the right person for the job and I vote for myself. But we kind of have this um, underlying idea that we shouldn't pump ourselves up that way, that we shouldn't vote for ourselves. And and that's that's silly because if you think you're the right person, obviously you do. But it, it is very interesting checking your box for the checking your uh, ballot with your name for the very first time. Um, getting elected in that 23, uh, 2013 election, um, you now have the responsibility of your community on your shoulders. You are going to be making decisions, especially on the municipal level. Municipal politics is such a uh, different realm of politics compared to provincial and federal. Municipal politics is where everything happens. Your garbage collection, your dog bylaws, your bylaws, your building permits, that is where your actual day-to-day -day influence on residents is going to be most felt. How was the weight walking into that first council meeting, knowing that the weight of your uh, villagers for your residents are now on your shoulders? It is, it is a burden that I'm happy to carry but every time I make a decision at the council table, you have to contemplate every side of the, of the story. So garbage collection is, is an, a good one because it's something that affects every single person in the community and we don't think about it. As long as, as, long as my garbage bit gets picked up in the alley and my garbage can gets put back where it was, most people don't tend to think about it. But a minor change to garbage collection affects your budget it affects service levels to your ratepayers. It affects how much garbage they're able to put out on a weekly basis. It affects their tendency to recycle and use blue bags or organic. Um, so, so it even affects the environment, you know, going to say bi-weekly garbage pickup, you're going to see more litter around your community, but you're going to save money on your budget. So when, when you're making what may seem like a mundane or a simple decision from a council perspective, you have to contemplate everything. And then in, in something that's unique to say my community with garbage collection is we have a lot of seasonal residents who maybe don't wanna pay for garbage collection all year round, but we are a full-time community. So there, there's always various aspects that you have to consider when making a decision and you make the decision that's best for the majority of the people that 
that live in your area. So it is, it is a huge responsibility. And as I said, municipal politics is the front line of politics in my, in my general sense. Municipal politicians will go to the local IGA, will go to the local grocery store, and they will hear full force if you make a wrong decision or if you make a decision that one resident might not agree with. As a council, as the deputy mayor of your village, how do you balance that? How do you balance work life with politics? Because work life and family life, because it is a challenging experience because you Every day you're literally working for the people that have put you in that position, but at the same time, you have to balance that work life as well, uh, that family life as well. So how do you do that? Well, it, that's been a bit of a process to find out. Uh, when I was first elected in 2013, I had not been anticipating the number of phone calls that I was going to get uh, at all hours of the day. Quite literally, I think we received a phone call at two o'clock in the morning once, uh, which prompted us to cancel our home phone. But uh, um, it, it's a process. And I think every politician has to kind of figure out what they're willing to accept from from others and what they're not willing to accept from others. And it, it took me a couple of years to figure that out. But now I'm always happy to talk about my community with people and I'm always happy to, to be stopped, but, but I do put out firm boundaries. So if I'm busy or I don't have time, or if my children are with me, I'm just very clear. I, I will talk about this with you later. Here's my contact information. Let's bring this conversation to a more appropriate place. And I've never really had pushback from the community when I do that. People seem to respect that I am a person outside of being a counselor. Uh, with the few odd exceptions, you know, it really irritates me when my kids get drug into it or or when they hear a comment about at school about something that their mother has done or something like that. That That's the hardest part for me is, is how it affects my kids. But my kids are, I think they're very proud of what I do. So they're, they take it lightheartedly. Well, you literally have just taken the next question out of my mouth was because I was wondering <laughs> how have your kids adapted to this new role that mom goes away and she's going to be dragged in multiple directions and she might be at a meeting for council or a, a subcommittee meeting for council or meeting with residents or a public hearing. So they've, they've adapted to the role that mom's just going to be working and uh, I'm okay with that and we're proud of her. I think so. I mean, I, women work all the time. Um, yeah. That is one of the things that I really enjoy about council is it gives me a really good work-life balance. My, my husband works in the trades and in the pipelines. So he's not home all of the time as that industry tends to go. So um, it was really important to me that I find a job where I can still be present in my community for my children. And in fact, this is a double win because not only am I present for my children, but I can actively improve my community and the life that they get to live here. And that helps not just them, but, but all of our residents. Let's talk about Alberta beach. Now the village of Alberta beach. This is the, this is the part that I enjoy because uh, <laughs> I, I enjoy learning about communities from people who live in their communities. Right. And especially from politicians, because they, they know how to brag about their community. <laughs> So I, I'm going to ask this starting question before we jump into the, uh, the the policy questions and how everything's going. Talk, tell, tell my listeners, what is Alberta, the village of Alberta Beach all about? Well, that that is a loaded question. That's, and, really and then I'm going to just play <laughs> off you for all the follow up questions I'm going to have. So what is the village of Alberta Beach all about? Um. I think at its core, we are uh, a full-time recreational community. That's a really rubber stamp answer. Um, but that is how we started, right? Our, our history says that we are a full-time recreational community. In fact, we have quite a unique history in Alberta Beach that defines who we are. Um, but we are so much more than that. Uh, we have all of the services that you would want from um from a place that you would choose to live and raise a family. Um, we have one of my favorite things about this community is our eclectic housing stock. You know, we have these massive, massive houses built next to rundown old cabins, which uh, when you walk down the streets, it's not kind of cookie cutter houses, which I absolutely love. We have huge lot sizes. Um, people in the city would call them estate size lots, you know, 50, 50 foot frontages. 
Um, the, yeah. the, Sorry, the, one thing I, the one thing I find interesting about the village is um, even on your website, even on the village of Alberta Beach's website, you say you have a population, according to the 2016 census, census of just over a thousand people. But during the summer months, that means nothing because you're about <laughs> 3000 people. You almost triple the size of your population during the summer months. Yeah. As a recreational uh, village, as a standard bearer for tourism in the village of tour, uh, village tourism, how are you adapting to that? Like, because you have a big influx of tourists coming into your community during the summer months, or even uh, potential summer residents coming into your uh, village during the summer months. As a counselor, how do you adapt to that change in population? Because services in the winter are going to be a lot less than services in the summer. Uh, <laughs> it is it is a constant struggle. Uh, generally speaking, this year aside, because this year brought it, its own unique um, challenges, uh, we plan for it. We've always been, I mean, we were a summer village up until 1999. So this is just a part of our, our culture here, and this is the way it's always been. I know the village website says that we we balloon to about 3,000 people in the summer, and, and that's accurate. But on a busy weekend, we're closer to five or 6,000 people. So it's wow. it is a huge amount of people, and we don't always have the infrastructure and the services available to help them. So after a long weekend, for example, if, if you troll our Facebook pages, you, you'll see, you know, people complaining about the garbage on the beach and uh, things like that. But after doing it for over 100 years, we, we've got it pretty well down to a science with with the few exceptions. We are we are built for it. You know, we not all of our lots have full time residents. So we are always expecting visitors. Uh, you mentioned it and I was going to bring it up until later in the interview, but we'll talk about it now. COVID-19 has decimated the tourism industry, uh, especially from outside of Alberta uh, coming into Alberta. How has the village handled this new and I don't want to say reality because I hope it goes back to normal. Uh, I, I'm hoping that when the vaccines are all rolled out and everyone is vaccinated, we can potentially get back to a, a, nor, uh, a 2019 status of <laughs> tourism. How has uh, Alberta Beach handled this? Because it is a, a thing that most municipalities are struggling with right now. The revenue is down. People are not coming to their communities anymore. So how has Alberta Beach uh, dealt with it? How's the village dealt with it? Uh, well, people are not not coming here. <laughs> okay. Last, <laughs> last last summer, we we had tried to follow all of the the guidelines, and we'd kept all of our washroom, like our public washroom facilities, closed. We'd kept all of our tourist type facilities closed, and we were inundated with people. You could not walk down our main street on a nice weekend last summer. Um, straight like you you were shoulder to shoulder with people so there was concern in the community obviously about spread of COVID which we have not had a lot of here um, but it's a very controversial issue in every municipality and and how to deal with it in every municipality um, and part of the dialogue was how much tax money from Alberta Beach should be going to to deal with the huge influx of visitors uh, so we were very grateful for the provincial stimulus funding, the most funding that we received to help cover some of the additional costs that we had. And, and we worked very closely with the provincial government when we started to have a problem with excessive amounts of people coming to the village. Um, and people that aren't necessarily accustomed to lake life may not be very water smart. Uh, that was definitely an issue and, and may not respect the, the natural environment that we do have here. So that was a concern, but the biggest one of course was COVID. So we worked closely with our MLA and the provincial government and, and we got extra police resources. We did a public education campaign. We had uniformed officers walking the beat for the first time in Alberta beach since I've been wow. here. Have I seen officers walking the beat? Um, but not in, in a negative disciplinary kind of way, more in an educational, did you know that these are issues, this is what you can do to protect yourself kind of a way. So we, we really relied on our, on our partners to get through the summer. Um, 
I, I don't, I, I don't want to come out and just ask this question, but I'm going to, um, okay. what's the, what's the biggest, what's the biggest uh, issue facing the residents and council of the village today with take, take away COVID-19 because yes, COVID-19 is a pandemic and everyone's facing that, but for the village, a local issue that is facing the people, because I will say, I, 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 I despise Facebook as much as I use it, but the community groups that I've seen municipalities have, they can be semi double edged swords where there can be some good conversations and there can be some bad conversations. What is the biggest issue in your opinion, in the council's opinion that is facing the people of the village today? You're going to make me pick one. Let's if there's more, let's talk about them. <laughs> and the reason I the reason I ask that is because you are so close to the uh, the, the former town of Wabaman that you yes. just saw them amalgamated into the county is that an issue that the village is dealing with as well or is the village in a stable position where they can sustain themselves because of the influx of tourism well I'll point That's out Wabaman also has tourism yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, so we are very different than Wabaman um, so clearly a municipal structure is top of mind for you right now <laughs> Um, and that that would be in my top three. Uh, if I had to, to pick three main issues, definitely municipal structure is one of them. Alberta Beach is a viable community. We do not have the same types of problems that Wabamin had. And when I speak about Wabamin's concerns, they lost a huge chunk of their tax base almost overnight when the power plant in their community shut down. Um, I could not imagine losing and, and I don't know what percentage of their tax base it was, but it, it was significant. I could not imagine losing that that overnight and then trying to find a viable path forward. We are not in that situation. We don't have a grossly fluctuating tax base here. We are primarily residential. So that's not, viability is not an issue. But when we talk about municipal structuring, we are bordered by two summer villages and we reside within Lac-Saint-Anne County. So for me personally, I find municipal structure to be an issue that we're going to have to deal with moving forward, especially as we're continuing to see downloading from other levels of government. We're seeing a loss of revenue through grants. The property tax system isn't set up to deal with huge capital infrastructure projects. It's just not meant for that. Uh, so I do think that every municipality has an obligation right now, especially in the fiscal climate that we're in, to look at its structure and evaluate what's right for it at the local level. There is not a cookie cutter approach to municipalities that will work. So for Wabamin, uh, dissolution may very well have been the right choice for them. But I think in the Alberta Beach area, the conversation needs to be more around three councils servicing, you know, 1600 people and then adding a sewer commission in there. So you have 11 councillors and four administrations uh, for 1600 people, which is a bit excessive. And we do spend an awful lot of time uh, just dealing with intermunicipal issues directly, directly related to the number of councillors that we have. Do and you guys have course, a region? Oh, go ahead. Sorry. We're, we're in lac saint -Anne County too, and, and Alberta Beach is built right to our borders at this point. We don't have a lot of reserve land. So we also have to work very closely with our county partners to work on cost and revenue sharing agreements and, and things like that. So it's, it's a lot of personalities in a very small space. Do you have that regional, regional collaboration in place that if there's an issue that the two summer villages that you just talked about uh, have that they need to expand or you need to expand and work with them because you want to make sure the sewer system all connects with everyone. Can you call them up and say, okay, we're, we need to fix this. We need to fix this today. Let's get together. Like, is that, is there that regional regional collaboration already in place? And was it in place when you got there in 2013? Um, <laughs> yes and no at the same time. So we are very open in our communications with each other for the most part. Obviously, we're three, four, four separate municipalities, if you include the county, with our own goals and, and unique circumstances. Um, but we, d we do talk an awful lot. And, and we do have uh, an intermunicipal development plan was put in place last term. 
we are so, so, so close to signing all of our intermunicipal collaboration frameworks. There's nothing in them that, that would, that causes any alarm bells for me. But obviously um, when it comes to say funding services, that can be an issue. Um, especially because the voting structure in a summer village is significantly different than a voting structure for every other municipality in Alberta. And that I think in and of itself presents a very unique challenge, not just for Alberta Beach, but for the councillors in those summer villages who have to try and balance the needs of their full-time residents and the needs of their part-time residents. Um, but from a resident standpoint, what are, what are the issues facing the residents today? Because you said there's three. We talked about structure. Let's talk about the other two. Um, I like putting people on the spot because they, <laughs> they, they don't know what to say. Because the great thing about these interviews, the, the, these conversations that I'm doing is while you might think you're off base by saying what you think residents are having. But if I talk to every member of your council, I guarantee you they would say something different for each issue, right? Mm -hmm. They would probably think the top three issues are something else compared to you. So yet again, this is a snapshot. This is not what every, every person of the village of Alberta beach is feeling, but this is what uh, Dep Deputy Mayor Angela Duncan believes are the top three issues that she that the residents are facing. So I just want to put that on the record because we have had people say, well, this isn't the issue I'm facing. Well, this is what we she's been hearing, correct? Yes. Okay. So uh, for full disclosure, municipal structure is actually on our residents' radar, which sounds really unusual, but they are talking about it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> they are, yeah. There's there's currently a petition out and then some, some letters floating around the village. So, so that is uh, on the radar, but um, I'd say our, our t other than that, um, from my perspective, uh, infrastructure, in particular roads and drainage are an issue in the village. And that's one that we hear about every single spring. It kind of falls off the radar by fall, but in spring it will rear its head again. Pothole season um, as we call it up north. Yeah, in, in Alberta Beach, it's not so much pothole season as it is okay. lose your truck season. Um, and I say that slightly tongue in cheek because we have fixed the larger issues there, but every springtime we get a massive amount of water that flows through the village. Obviously water runs towards lakes yeah. <laughs> and being built on the side of a lake means that the water runs through the village. So that's always an issue. Properties flooding in the springtime is always an issue. Overland flooding happens here every year. I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge that that was true. Um, and, and our roads, when they were originally built, weren't built with proper bases to them. You know, we, we sprung up as a tourist summer type community. People just kind of slapped roads and cabins down wherever they felt like it. So that's always an issue. Um, and then that goes directly to the next issue, which rears its head every year, which is lakeside living. And there's a whole slew of concerns around lakeside living. But the fluctuating water levels, flooding, and the ice quakes that we sometimes get are definitely top of mind when I think of, of issues that are potentially more unique to the village. So uh, how is this council dealing with those issues? Partnerships. <laughs> no, that, that seems like... One word answers are the best. <laughs> no, we work, we work exceptionally closely with our MLA. We work exceptionally closely with Alberta Environment and Parks, and we work very closely with our municipal labor neighbors when it deal when we're dealing with um, water issues. And we, we also have partnerships, for example, with our local water quality society, where we sit on the Sturgeon River Watershed Alliance, which is a, su a subsidiary of the NSWA. Um, oh, sorry, that's the North Saskatchewan Watershed Alliance. For anybody who's not familiar with my acronyms, I'll try not to use them. Uh, so we really rely not just on our own expertise, but on on the expertise and knowledge of those around us. Um, infrastructure is one of these ongoing issues. It's not going to be fixed tomorrow. It's not going to be fixed in a week. Uh, it's not going to be fixed in a year because, like you said, you live on a you live beside a lake, and frost heave is a massive issue. A lot of water sat sat saturation, sorry, is a big issue, especially for overland flooding. 
is there things that you're doing year to year to uh, rectify that? Like, are you choosing, okay, we know the base for road X, Y, and Z are not the best. They are the three worst out of the village. We need to fix them this year because if not, they're going to be even worse next year. Is there a plan or a, a, a operations master plan to make sure that the most needed infrastructure deficits are being addressed year to year and not being pushed off, pushed off, pushed off. Yes. <laughs> That's one of the things that since 2013, when I got on council, we've really been pushing for. So we, we do have our capital budgets and our capital plans, but if you look at those and, and you read them appropriately, you'll see that roads and drainage are our number one issue. Um, that being said, we did just uh, work with our sewer commission to replace the force main on our sewer line, which was our most pressing concern. So now that the sewer system is, is up and running, and of course, we're still working on capital replacement plans there, but that, that was a huge issue. We, we kept having um, sewer breaks. Our, our sewer system, our main, our main line actually ran right down the main street, right next to the lake. And so every time we'd have a break there, because um, it was heavily impacted by, by frost heaves and things like that, every time we'd have a break there, it was a huge environmental issue. So we, we moved that and now it comes back through the back of the village instead of the front. Um, so after that, we moved on to roads and drainage. And we do have a road and drainage master plan that we're following. But every year we kind of look at and see where are the roads the absolute worst? Where will our money have the biggest bang for our buck? And, and we're replacing those roads first. But at the same time, we're replacing culverts and improving the drainage in those areas all at the same time. One thing that I've heard from numerous municipal councillors when I talk to them is communication, 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 communication to, to the residents, not to the, uh, the uh, regional collaboration, but to the residents. I was surprised to hear that the top three issues, yet again, these are the top three issues you're hearing. Communications wasn't on that list. How do you feel the, the village has done communicating to its residents? An honest answer? Honest answer. Poorly. Okay. <laughs> How can we how can we fix that? Well, see that that one's really tough because I think communication has to go both ways. So I firmly believe that municipalities are the most open and honest and transparent level of government. Everything that we do, all of our policies, all of our bylaws, all of our budgets, all of our master plans, uh, all of that must by law be posted on the website. So if somebody wants the information, it is absolutely available to them. Uh, council meetings are open to the public. They, the, the information is there should people choose to get it. But it, the problem is that it has to be in a format that works for them. Um, and people don't want to have to search it out. So while I say communication is a two-way street, I think the, the broader impetus must be on the council to communicate. Um, and we could do better. Every, every term we say we're going to have, you know, monthly letters, well, not letters, because that actually there's a budget implication, by the way, to communication. Um, but we say we're going to do better and, and we do for a short while and then it kind of falls back because it's not that two way street where we get anything back. Um, personally, I would love to see us putting out even quarterly updates that are more in depth than what we currently do. You know, we, we currently found out information on our Facebook page, um, but we don't really talk about strategic direction with the community as much as I think that we should. I th and, and the village isn't the only uh, municipality that is facing that issue. I talked to uh, councillors from cities and towns and they are saying the exact same thing. They are saying that while it's a two way street, you can put out as much information as you want. If you don't hear that feedback, you're not going to potentially know where you could be doing better or it could be yes. diverting your resources into a better, more sustainable way that residents will see. Right. And they yes. residents want to know where their tax dollars are being spent at the end of the day. They do. And they have a right to know. And as much as the information is there, when you look through a municipal budget, it can be very difficult to decipher what it all means. <laughs> but but it goes back to my earlier comment that if you're going to complain, you have a responsibility to do something. 
and in, in the sense of a municipal council, our counselors are very accessible. So if there's a concern in the community, we may not know about it. So it, doing something about it can be as simple as sending an email or making a phone call. And, and if you go through the administration office and you don't like what you hear, or you don't get the response that you think you should have gotten, then you need to contact your counselors and let them know that there's an issue because if we don't know about it, we cannot fix it. The next set of questions is your second, uh, I wouldn't say second job, but your second municipal experience that I wanna talk about, your time on the AUMA for the those who are listening, the Alberta Urban Municipality Association, correct? Yes. Yes, and I, I had to make sure I got the your, your title correct on this one. You are the director of Villages West, correct? That's one of my titles there. Okay, what is your second title? I am vice president representing Villages and Summer Villages. Okay. And director of Villages West. So for those who are listening who might not know what that, what that role entitles, what does that role entitle? Those roles, I should say. Collectively, so the... AUMA, the Alberta Urban Municipalities Association, represents all urban municipalities, with the exception, I think, of two or three summer villages uh, within the province of Alberta. So I advocate for municipal issues at the provincial level. And in particular, I make sure that villages and summer villages are well represented, that I know what the concerns are in villages and summer villages throughout Alberta, and that I'm able to effectively voice their concerns and hopefully um, cause change that benefits small communities. The reason I ask that is when people, when residents from across Alberta look at funding from provincial and federal governments, they usually see the majority of the funds, and I, and I hate to pick on the big cities here, but they usually go to the larger cities, Calgary, Grand Prairie, Lethbridge, Medicine Hat, uh, Edmonton, Red Deer. Then they trickle down to a little bit less to the towns, and then they trickle down even less to potentially to the villages. How do you, and, and, I'm, and I could be wrong here, and I could be wrong. Yes, there are some times when villages and towns get a big chunk of money, but for the most part, and I hate to use the political terms here, the seats are in the urban center, so let's put the money where the voters are. How do you advocate for villages in your role as director of Villages West and your VP uh, for villages and summer villages in that role to ensure the fair share is being uh the fair share of tax revenue and tax dollars are being put into well cities, but also villages and summer villages. Well, that's always a balancing act. Um, when we look at different sizes of municipalities, we are all unique, but we all have similar, <clears throat> pardon me, we all have similar type of needs. You know, at the end of the day, we all need access to health care. We all need access to broadband. We all need infrastructure funding. We all need public transportation, which may sound interesting for a small community to say that we need public transportation, but we do not have a hospital in our community. Um, so, you know, the closest doctor's office is 15 minutes down the road and on a way. We do have a pharmacy though, <laughs> um, but we all have similar issues. They're just different in scale and the solutions are different for every community. So when I'm advocating for smaller municipalities, I'm advocating to make sure that, that our needs are met at, a, at the same or similar level to what you'd see in a larger center. While also recognizing that when you choose to live in a rural community, there's a certain level of understanding that you don't have the same access to service that you would get in a larger community. So I'm always trying to close that gap. But for example, when we look at the city of Edmonton and they're surrounded by other large metropolitan areas, you know, all of the, you know, St. Albert, Spruce Grove, Stony Plain, Sherwood Park, they have a huge economy of scale. So they're able to, to use their dollars to create larger projects. And that's a huge challenge for a small municipality. Um, I'll give an example. So Alberta Beach has no water distribution system. 
Okay, we have, we've spent since 2008, I believe we started working to bring water to our borders. Now we have EPCOR water that comes directly to our borders and that's a regional collaboration. But the cost to put in a water distribution center in the uh, system in the village is astronomical. It is not possible for us to do that on uh, property taxes alone. So we very much rely on programs like the ICIP uh, funding that came from, sorry, that's the Invest uh, Canada Investment. It's a federal program. I, I couldn't tell you what the acronym means. Off Infrastructure the top of my head. Canada administers that. Thank you. Yes, yes, Infrastructure Canada, and and so we really rely on on that program. We rely on the municipal water and wastewater partnership through the province, um, and those are not. That's not funding that we just automatically get. So whereas the larger centers typically they're allocated a certain amount of funding and they certainly do still have to apply for grants, but it's a different process for them than it is for us. So it's a competitive process when it comes to small municipalities and quite often we don't have the administrative expertise to um, really dive in and, and access those grants. So it's, it's not that the funding's not there, it's that we really have to fight for it. But if you're willing to fight for it, you can get it. And, and so I'm constantly trying to advocate for it to be easier for small municipalities to access the dollars that, that have been set aside for us um, because it's there. We just, we need to get it. And, and they're usually really large projects that require um, intermunicipal collaboration. In, in that role, have you found that you've been working a lot more with your MLA? Because uh, AUMA is one of the, if not the largest organizations, uh, municipal organizations in Alberta. Uh, I think rural urban municipalities is uh, the Rural Municipal Association of Alberta, if I'm not mistaken, is close to it as well. But have you been working close with your MLA and have they, and I'm assuming they have because they want the best for all their, their residents as well. Um, when you go to them and say, okay, we need a solution for this municipality, this village, have they been able to work with you as the AUMA and in your role as director of Villages East and VP of Villages and uh, Summer Villages? We do work very closely with our MLA. He is very, very actively involved in the community, but I don't speak a lot with him on those larger provincial issues. Uh, it's more local issues. He's really championing us um, as we try to find solutions to our lake issues, our lake levels, lake health, things like that. Uh, he's a huge champion for, for the local communities. When it comes to provincial matters, I, I tend to speak more with ministers. Okay. Um, before we jump into the very last section of this, I want to take a moment here and I, I want you to pitch. I want you to pitch my listeners when this COVID-19 is over or this summer, why should people come visit the, vill uh, the village of Alberta Beach? Because I, I looked on your website, I, I, I want to go to so many of your events that you hold, like the <laughs> SOMO event, like the Poly Days, but why should people come to the village? Oh my goodness, why shouldn't you come to the village? <laughs> <laughs> this this is my favorite part. I've been looking forward to this one. So I'm, I just I want to I want to touch a bit on on our history so that what yep. I'm going to say makes more sense. So Alberta Beach was originally um, a whistle stop for the rail line, and and we were not a whistle stop in the commerce sense of rail. We have always been a tourist destination, and when we were originally um, forming as a village in 1920. Before that, the rail lines, I believe it was CN, had actually, they were running um, weekend excursions to the village so that their staff and, and people from Edmonton could come out and enjoy the lake for the weekend because it is just such a beautiful and picturesque place to visit and to live. So that's, that's how we were founded. And then by the time the rail line stopped running here, I think it was in 1936, the rail line shut down we had built a huge dance pavilion um, on what is now our main beach. So every Saturday night, when you talk to the, to the people who have been around this village for you know, 50 years, they will go on and on about this dance pavilion and the dances that they used to have. And then right next to it was our, our historic pier that we had that went out into the lake. Now, unfortunately that pier uh, had to be torn down for safety reasons um, 
but but our history here is really rich and and so the first thing i want to pitch to you is our heritage village museum um which sounds odd that we would have a museum but our original train station is actually in our museum our original jailhouse our original church our original schoolhouse even the teacherage is in our museum. So Alberta Beach has preserved its history. And, and so in 2020, it was our centennial year. We had huge plans last summer for our centennial. Unfortunately, COVID kind of dampened them. But our, um, our museum society actually put out a huge history book as well that involved interviewing people that have been in this community, um, in one case, 100 years. Wow. So it's it's really cool. And our unique history really plays into who we are as a community and who we are as a village. Uh, so I'd be remiss if I did not uh, start by talking about that. Um, and then, of course, we, we are a festival community as well. So we have our, our poly days, which is August long weekend. In the winter, we have our snowmo days, um, which is like these big snowmobile drag races on the lake. Last year, we even had... Um, ice racing like uh like almost like nascar style racing on the lake it was really it was something to watch i'll tell you that uh we have a huge snowmobile culture in the winter obviously we have water sports and and lots of recreation in the summer uh, the community comes together every family day and does a big community barbecue uh, we have ball tournaments oh and we have a farmer's market Oh. Our farmer's market is, is renowned. It is, it is huge. Um, every Sunday, we, ha we have a farmer's market that's put on by our local agricultural society. On Friday nights, we have food truck Fridays where it's free for any food truck vendor to come out and set up in the village. Uh, so we really work to, to create this atmosphere of community, which actually really speaks wonders to our volunteer community. We have an extremely active volunteer community in this area and, and a real sense of community that kind of follows that. So um, there's no reason not to come to Alberta Beach. You know, it's, it's beautiful. We have all of the amenities that you could possibly want. We have a beach, although this year, unfortunately, it was underwater. But uh, when the water levels go down, we have amazing sandy, sandy beaches that it, like it's and you can walk out onto our lake. I can walk. Oh my goodness, probably a hundred meters and not be underwater. The, it's really wow. quite shallow. I, I'm, don't, don't quote me on the, uh, on the <laughs> distance, but it, it really depends on how high the water levels are. But like you can walk and just keep walking. Um, every year we have the pilgrimage, which isn't in Alberta Beach, but obviously uh, we're a huge service center for them. And that's because the, the waters in Lac St. Anne are considered healing by the, the um, indigenous people here. So there's just so much about Alberta Beach that makes it worth visiting. The one thing that I find so fascinating about the village, and you, you mentioned it so eloquently there, is your beach. You have sandy beaches. Municipalities across this province are so jealous when they see other municipalities who are lakefront, who have sandy beaches, who have that tourism right at their front door because I know municipalities are facing hardships because they're trying to do or recreate what the village has done because they have beaches but they're not properly uh, uh, raked or however you want to pronounce it they're not properly cleaned every year so it's hard for them so I, I would agree if you haven't go visit the village of Alberta Beach even if it is just for their beach because it is one of the most spectacular beaches in all of Alberta. Yes. While you say that, though, I'll, I'll put a disclaimer. Some of our residents will probably cringe when they hear that just because <laughs> with the water levels being so high these last couple of years, our beach is underwater. Uh, but <laughs> it's still cyclical and, and we still do have a beautiful area that, that you can go. You know, we try to clean it up every Friday, but when the water levels go down, even, you know, six inches, if the, because we're so shallow, six inches of water level will give us 15, 20 feet of beach. Oh, wow. Um, the one last question about the village I want to talk about here. Is there a high vacancy rate? Can people come move to the village? Is there uh, areas that they can build in the village? Because um, 
as people retire, they want to get out of the hustle, hustle and bustle of large urban centers and they want to go to a little small community like the Alberta Beach. So what is it like to potentially move to Alberta Beach? Is it is it easy? Is there uh, vacancies there? Is there potential for land development there? Because I know you talked about you're, you're at your borders earlier in the interview, but is there spots where people can still build? Yes, there is. <laughs> Uh, so there are houses for sale in, in the village, um, as there are in every municipality, and some of them are full-time houses that have been built for that. We do have a lot of vacant or underdeveloped lots that are for sale, uh, you know, where you have your, your old cabins, um, and maybe they've been passed down generationally that have gone up for sale, I think, during the pandemic and the economic downturn. A lot of those properties, obviously, um, people are looking to, to offload them. So there's options. I, I'll give a plug for myself personally. We actually have areas of the village that are zoned for tiny homes. So if you're looking to downsize into, into like a lake type feeling, or even if you want a residential lot that's seasonal in nature, uh, we, we have actively zoned areas for tiny homes, which I pushed for. I'm very proud that we've managed to do that. Uh, I think you need a, a good... A good variety of housing options in a community like ours. Um, we have every amenity you could need. Uh, we, we have a school, we have a library. Our library is so very cute and they're very active in our community. Um, we've got a full service grocery store, a senior center uh, that has a 50 plus club in it. Um, everything, you could, everything you could need, we have it. Um, and it just feels like like home when you move here. That's awesome. Now my last question for you, because we are at the 50 minute mark and I wanna make sure I get this in. Um, 2021, municipal election season coming up. <laughs> you, you laugh, but I'm gonna ask this question because I've asked it to all the other municipal councillors. Are we expecting to see another run from Angela Duncan in 2021. Please note that this is coming out in May. So if you haven't made the decision, I, I will be happily just keep moving on. But I will ask this question because as the former journalist, I need to ask the question. Are we expecting a re-election for Angela Duncan or a run for re-election for her? Angela Duncan. We are expecting a run for re-election. Yes, I am. I'm running again. And fingers crossed, uh, the residents will... Uh, give me four more years. And my uh, second last question, what do you want to address in the next four years? What are the pressing issues that you want to address? We talked about structure, municipal structure, we talked about infrastructure, but personally for you, what are the things that you want to see change to make sure that the village continues to move forward like it has been? Uh, so right now we're working on an overview of our land use bylaw. So I chair that project and I would like to see it through to completion. We had planned to get it finished this term, but COVID really put a snafu in our ability to operate. So um, that is something that I, I really want to finish. Um, community revitalization. I want to work on policy that's going to allow us to infill some of our less developed lots and, and have some of our older cabins be replaced with something newer um, that people will move into. I would like to continue to see our community grow. I would like to see more businesses on our main street. We do have a couple vacant areas. So we're working on some business friendly policies. Uh, I will point out Alberta Beach does not have a business bylaw. So there's no business license fees to operate in Alberta Beach. Got to put that plug in there for you. Um, <laughs> We are working on a beach and boat launch maintenance plan. Um, and obviously for me, the environment is a huge factor. So I'm always working on plans to improve the environment um, and obviously community service groups and working with them. We have our, our beach wave park, um, which is funded by our community service groups and municipal partners, uh, continuing to improve that and to improve the infrastructure there and the services that are provided there. Oh, there's just, there's just so much work to do. It's just never done. <laughs> then my last question is, for those considering a potential run for uh, municipal politics, because it is a tough decision. It is a, like, you don't get paid full-time uh, dollars, but it's a full-time job. 
What would you say to the people who are seriously considering running for municipal politics today? I would encourage them to talk to somebody who has or is involved in municipal politics to get a really good idea of what the job entails. Uh, you see a lot of people run and, and they don't quite understand the time commitment and the lack of pay that goes along with that time commitment. It is to be a local politician at this level. It is a, an active um, love for your community <laughs> more than anything, but so I really encourage them to, to understand what they're signing up for and to really evaluate your motives. Um, I think you have to be there because you want to improve your community and do right by the people that live there and visit there. So it's really frustrating sometimes when, when somebody comes in and, and they have a very specific issue that they want dealt with. Um, you really need to be open to the conversation and open to hearing new ideas and new perspectives, uh, especially if you wanna be effective. Awesome. With that, Deputy Mayor Angela Duncan, I want to thank you so much for this. Greatly appreciate it. And for the, my listeners, um, the her link to uh, the Village's website and to their Facebook page will be in the show notes. So I recommend that you go check it out because like uh, we've talked for the last hour, it is a spectacular community it is. and it is always growing. And if you were seriously considering getting out of the hustle bustle of large centers, I would highly recommend making it one of the first stops along your way of potential your forever home. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you once again for listening to the Cross Border Interview Podcast. If you love this episode of the Cross Border Interview Podcast, head over to iTunes or wherever you get your podcast and subscribe, rate us, and leave us a review. All the links to our social media accounts are in the show notes or visit www.crossborderinterviews.ca. The Cross Border Interview Podcast was produced and edited by Miranda Brown and Associates Incorporated. Be sure to tune in for our next episode of the Cross Border Interview Podcast. Once again, thank you. Whoa!